Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Rouge Free Will Baptist Church Online Sunday School. It is wonderful to be here with you today. It is Sunday morning, February the 28th, the last day of February, and it's 9 o'clock. And so we are here ready to dive back into our, uh, our topic of the book of Revelation. We'll be in chapter 13 today, although we are going to do a character study. So we won't be going uh, verse by verse. We'll start that hopefully next week. But I want to just introduce you to a pretty interesting character that you need to, to, to know about. So I want to say good morning to all of you as you're coming on. And, and thank you for being here. Let me just make a little adjustment. Um, uh, we are glad to be here. It's good to see all of you here. Uh, this morning, uh, my wife Rhonda is not up to par. She is, uh, those of you following the program know that she's been uh, having a real issue with her back the last couple of weeks. And uh, so she did not have a great night last night. So she may be joining us sometime through the broadcast, but she will not be taking part today. So uh, you I'll just have to ask you to be patient with me with your questions and comments. If I see them, I see them. And if I don't, I promise you I'll get to them and answer them uh, as soon as I go back over the scroll. But it is good to see all of you coming on. It's a kind of a rainy, cloudy morning this morning on the last day of February. But March is tomorrow, and the good Lord allows us to get up in the morning uh, we will be right in the month of March and headed towards springtime. So, <laughs> so we're all pretty excited about that. All right, as you're all coming on, and it's so good to see you, uh, let me just uh, start out by having prayer with you, and then we'll do our Billy Graham devotion of the day, and then we'll get right into Revelation 13 and talk about the Antichrist. All right, so hopefully most of you have gotten your outline. If you have not, then uh, I, you know, you will be receiving it very soon. Uh, although hopefully the idea today is to just go through it, highlight it today about our discussion of the Antichrist, and get back into the verse by verse study of chapter thirteen next week. All right, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. And please, throughout the day, two things that came across the prayer chain, they're on our prayer list on the Master's Men uh, Facebook page and the Women Active for Christ page. As for uh, Elizabeth Buckner, who's back in the hospital uh, after having a bad fall during the week and having a very severe cut, she is back in the hospital having some issues. And, uh, of course, Glenda O'Connor. Now, this is the mother of Kathleen Gear and the sister of Sister um, Susan Garza, and she is having difficulty and needs our prayers today, as many do, but we are just grateful and we're asking God for them today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence today, we are grateful and thankful, Lord, for this time that we have together. And Lord, as we approach the throne of grace today, we do ask you specifically today for uh Glenda O'Connor and Elizabeth Buckner, and I pray, God, today that you have taken care of them already. I pray, God, that they have been blessed and touched by the hand of God, and I pray, God, that you'll just continue the healing for their life. We pray for all of those on our prayer list, God, and we thank you and praise you for the prayers that you have answered, and God, for what you're going to do in the future. And now, Lord, as we open up your word and we look into the word of God today, I pray, God, that for clarity of mind and thought, I ask you, God, to allow the Holy Spirit to lead our discussion. And I pray, Father, today that you will be pleased with everything that is said and done today, and that it will bring honor and glory to you and illumination to your children and to all those who tune in to hear what the word of God has to say. We ask this today in Jesus' name, amen, amen. And again, it is good to see you all joining us today. And let's look and see what Dr. Graham has for us on the last day of February, February the 28th. And he entitles this devotion, A Passion 
to please God. Wow, that's a good one, right? And here's the scripture verse. I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. And that's Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. And here's what Dr. Graham brings to us today. Popularity and praise can be far more dangerous for the Christian than persecution. They can turn us away from God without even being aware of it, making us like those in Jesus' day who love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's John chapter 12, verse 43. Unfortunately, it is easy when all goes well to lose our perspective. Instead, we must learn like Paul to be content in whatever state we find ourselves. The important thing is to have one consuming passion to please Christ. Then whatever happens, we know he has permitted it to take place to teach us and to perfect us for his service. He will enrich our circumstances, be they pleasant or disagreeable, by his presence with us. Ask God to keep you from worrying about what others think and to be content with whatever he sends your way. All the tomorrows of our lives have to pass him before they get to us. Isn't that amazing? And boy, Pastor talks about that all the time. Nothing happens to us that doesn't go by the throne of grace first. God knows. So be content, whatever state you're in, wherever you are, uh, be content with what you have and where you are. It is very, very easy, you know, I, I, I uh, and I'll be honest with you, and maybe Pastor will acknowledge the same thing. I don't know. You know, we've talked about this before in Brother Mike Ringle. Sometimes, like, doing things like this, and, and suddenly you're exposed to not just your church family, but you're exposed to everybody. Everybody that tunes in on Facebook can see you. And sometimes good things happen. Some things, bad things happen. But sometimes folks can can praise you and thank you to the point where you can get lifted up and you have to you have to make sure your focus is on God and realize that none of this is possible without God without the Holy Spirit without Jesus Christ realize that I am nothing as John said he must increase but I must decrease and that is exactly the only way we reach the world for the gospel of Christ is if he is lifted up, not us. So, and stay humble before the Lord. You see this happen so much with men of God all over the world. Uh, one latest, uh, you might say, tragedy is Ravi Zacharias. And I don't know if you know the story and what's gone on with that, but I'll just tune you in. Ravi Zacharias, probably behind Billy Graham, was one of the most well-known evangelists in the world. Uh, probably not as well known in the United States, although he, he should have been, but he because his ministry took him really into dark places and to places where the gospel was not welcomed. And now, uh, un unfortunately, it's been revealed by his family. And uh, after, you know, he passed away earlier in the year, I believe it was back in March. And now we find out through a, a investigation that was started by his family and and the ministry that he built, RISM, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, that Ravi had been uh, guilty of sexual sins and had been for some time. It just goes to show you, folks, and you, that first of all, you should never put your trust and faith in man, but it also goes to show you that even someone who has a tremendous ministry can fall in the clutches of Satan when we let our guards down and we start thinking too highly of ourselves. So that is what, be content. If God has put you in a position, there's a reason you're there and God, and God has a plan. He has a great plan for your life. Trust him, trust him. All right. Let's now look into our outlines and talk about uh, 
the revelation of Jesus Christ in chapter 13 and the Antichrist. There's some things that I want to, uh, I'm going to give you some verses. As, and what we're going to do today is a character study. We're going to just talk specifically about the Antichrist before we really delve in to a verse-by-verse -verse study of chapter 13. The Antichrist, and especially get familiar with the verbiage spirit of Antichrist. Because um, the spirit of Antichrist was all the way back in the days of John and even in the days of Jesus, the spirit of Antichrist was present. It has grown substantially as the years have gone by. Now that does not mean, and I want you to understand, and you'll find out uh, as we go through chapter 13, that the what we call the Antichrist, or, and he will actually be termed the beast, is a real person, he is an individual that will be raised up in during the tribulation period. But the spirit of Antichrist exists even today, and that's what we want to talk about. And so, I hope you're ready. But I'll tell you, if you take what you have learned, and let's just, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, one of the first places I want you to turn is Matthew 24, all right? Now, from what we've already gone through, if you take what you've learned in these past weeks and months of the book of Revelation, and, you, and what you're going to learn as we proceed into chapter 13 even deeper, you're going to be able to look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24 with new eyes, because we get very confused sometimes when we read Matthew 24 in the words of Jesus. But I want you to understand, the message is to us, don't get me wrong about that, but he is speaking directly to his disciples and to the nation of Israel in Matthew 24. The book of Matthew is primarily written uh, to um, the Jews. Uh, you know, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Each one of them seems to have a significant writing to a certain group of people. And Matthew is really kind of, uh, a, much of the words of the book of Matthew are written primarily about and to Israel and the Jews. That doesn't mean it isn't for us. It absolutely is for us. But you can just tell by some of the language. Now look at some of the things that Jesus says. And it's 51 verses, so we're not going to read them all. But look at some of the things Jesus says. And he says in, in, in verse 4, and we're going to start there, and, and I would love to go into the other verses, but um, we're going to kind of, we've already talked about some of those verses, and we'll talk more about them later. Jesus answered the disciples who had showed Jesus the temple. And Jesus answered to them, and they wanted to know, you know, what are the, and finally they sit down and say, what are the signs of your coming? This coming you're talking about, the end of the world, what do you mean by this? And what do you, And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed first of all that no man deceive you. Because it's very easy for us, even today, to be deceived. In fact, the world is being deceived. Even at this moment, we are being deceived by the spirit of Antichrist. And he says in verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Keep in mind, the actual definition of Antichrist is exactly what the term sounds like. It is anything that is against Christ. John goes further in, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Listen to what John says to us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. But every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this, he says, is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is it in the world. 
So John gives you a clear definition of what the Antichrist is and what the spirit of Antichrist is, and then lets you know it is already in the world. So Jesus tells us, and here's something as we go through. He tells us, you know, and, and you look in verse eight, uh, 6 and 7, he talks about the wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation. We already have seen that, and we already see it today, right? There have been more people killed in our wars in the 20th century than there were all the wars of all the previous years before. So that's a clear-cut uh, prophecy for you of the wars and rumors of wars. And he says nation's going to rise against nation. There'll be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. I don't think if you follow the news at all in the last few years, I don't think that's any problem understanding what Jesus is saying there. And we're hearing by the experts, uh, scientists of our day that are telling us that they are going to get worse. We're going to see more hurricanes. We're going to see more tornadoes. We're going to see more natural disasters. And that's not, the Bible told you that 2,000 years ago. But now our scientists are catching up and saying the storms and the things we're seeing now, we're going to see even more. And verse 8 is a key verse. It tells you, and you've heard Pastor talk about this, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I say that to you to help you understand that you are not, as a child of God, will not, and we've already established this, but I repeat it again, we are not going to go through the tribulation period. We are not going to see the mark of the beast. We are not going to uh, get to the point where where everything we've read so far in the tribulation period, that's not going to happen to us. We will be gone in the rapture of the church because the tribulation period cannot happen until the rapture of the church occurs. Now, having said that, that does not mean, and Jesus warns here, that does not mean that we will not and are not seeing the beginning of sorrows. The Christian who believes that he or she will escape persecution is really uh, living in a delusion. You should be able to look at the world circumstances that are happening today and see what is coming around. Pay attention to the signs and what is being said. Uh, and you should know that we are getting ready to begin, if we haven't already, and we actually are, we actually are, the Christian church and the Christian who believes in Jesus is already starting to come under great attack, both governmental and in our everyday life. But this is only going to increase. And Jesus says, but don't worry about that. These things must happen for the end to come. Before we can see the glories of heaven, of the new heaven, and the new earth, and the new Jerusalem, these things must happen. Look at verse 11. Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Now, the, you're going to read in the book of Revelation, we're going to talk a little bit about it today, that there will be a false prophet. Everything, the Antichrist is everything that's against Christ. And just like there is a trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there is also going to be a trinity of the Antichrist. Satan, the beast, and the false prophet, which we're going to learn more about as in the days ahead. Look at verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. This is not, again, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the age of grace is coming to the end in the tribulation period, it will be the gospel of the kingdom of God, of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, let's just, and I want to move on because I got to get, want to get on with this. So, look at verse, oh, verse 21 tells you, after all the things that Jesus says in the prior verses, but then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world 
to this time, nor ever shall be. And that's what we're going to really get into in chapter 13. Now, if any man say unto you in verse 23, lo, his Christ, there, don't believe it. Because Christ is not coming secretly, and Christ is not coming the way they think. He's not coming as a Messiah. He's not coming as a second time to walk on the earth. He came the first time to bring salvation. He's coming, his, his coming is in the book, in the tribulation, he is coming to build his kingdom and to destroy all evil. So when you look at all those verses, and I'm, you know, it, it, it just, you can read it with a fresh set of eyes and know that your redemption draweth nigh. So this thing called the Antichrist, I want, to, I want you to turn with me. If you have your notes, I want you to turn with me. Now, I, I put a lot of good information for you there, and especially a comparison about Christ and the Antichrist. Remember what Christ is? The Antichrist is just the opposite. But he mirrors everything that Christ does. He mirrors Satan and the Antichrist try to mirror everything that God does. But they're counterfeit miracles. He, the false prophet will be able to, to uh, bring miraculous miracles. But they are miracles that are mirroring and are not true miracles, not of God. Think about, if you would, Moses and the children of Israel when Moses goes up to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has, his, uh, has all of his priests to throw down their rods and they all become serpents. And Moses throws down his rod, and it becomes a serpent and eats up all their serpents. So that is, uh, that is, again, the spirit of Antichrist that goes throughout the Bible, that goes right into the tribulation period. Anything God does, Satan tries to mirror it. He will even will find out that this beast that we'll talk about in chapter 13 will suffer a mortal wound, will die, but will be resurrected, trying to imitate, and, and will be given great power, trying to imitate what Christ did, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's why you have to be so careful and in tune. Get your prayer life. Listen, if you are not praying on a regular basis right now, let me beg you to start getting a regular prayer life. You, if you're not founded in the word of God in the days to come, even before the tribulation gets here, if you're not founded in the word of God and in a prayer life that is, that is uh, giving you fellowship with God, you're going to be deceived. There will be no half-hearted Christians in the days ahead. You are going to be called to separate yourself. The world is going to separate you by what you believe and what you stand for. You're going to be, they will separate you. You will not be able, and listen to my, listen to me, friends. If you're out there today living a half-hearted Christian life, if you're living right on the edge and just doing what you have to do to maintain good fellowship with the church, you're making a huge mistake. You cannot ride on the fence. The world God and pastors talked about this, but it's the truth, and you'll see this. The world is going to make you. The world, and it's going to be because of God, but the world will actually force you to separate yourself from what you believe and the gospel stand that you take. You will not be able to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but, 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 you, I am a Christian, and I serve the one true Lord and God, and the Bible says this is wrong, and therefore it's wrong. And you will, you will make a stand one way or the other in the days that are coming before the rapture of the church. Too many people today living on the edge. So I did put something a little interesting in there about the nationality that always comes up, and it comes up even more in the culture. So I'm not going to talk about that today. I just put that there for information. But keep in mind, and I, and I stress several times, that that is speculation. Uh, it's fun to look into. It's fun to research. 
you can actually get in the Word of God and do a lot of that, but I don't want to talk about that today. I've put that there for your information. What I want to talk about is the future activities of the Antichrist. And so, there are, and, uh, there are uh, seven characteristics of the Antichrist that I want to, that I want you to see. First of all, as we look into, and now we've seen this in Revelation chapter six, verse two, that's his rise to power. How the Antichrist will go from where he is to where he, the position that he will hold when it comes to the tribulation period. And we learned that he will come in the latter days. And we learned that in, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, that he is that white horse wearing many crowns with a bow, but no arrows. And in other words, he will uh, rise to power. And you'll find this in the book of Daniel as well. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. He will rise to power through diplomacy. Talking about peace, 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 that he has the ability to, to conquer many, but he's going to do it through the deception that he can bring peace. And he will rise to power through this. He won't do it through war. He will do it because he will bring, be able to bring, and we'll talk about this later, even to the point where he will be able to bring a covenant with Israel that will last for seven years. That is also prophesied in the book of Daniel, that he can bring peace. And Israel and the Antichrist will make a covenant that will allow Israel to go back home and in, in, uh, and inhabit Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But keep in mind that is a false temple because the Messiah has already come and we don't, as born again Christians, we don't need a temple. We are the temple. But this is a trick that the Antichrist will use to keep Israel's eyes off of God and off of the circumstances that are around them and they will be and they will return to their old form of Judaism which is antichrist so you can see that he's going to trick the world leaders that he can and gain the support remember of the 10 kings that we talked about the european common market and we'll talk more and more about that that there will be 10 kings the 10 toes of the image of nebuchadnezzar in daniel chapter 2 these 10 kingdoms that will give their power to the Antichrist when they realize that they cannot bring peace to the world, but what he's doing, he convinces them that he can, even though it's a false peace. So his rise to power is predicted in Revelation 6-2 and in Daniel 8-25, and that's how he will do it, through diplomacy. He will not do it. He's going to be a smooth talker. He's going to be very charismatic, and be able to convince the world leaders that he has the answer to world peace. Now, when that happens, and he will form a one world government. Again, this one world government is predicted in the image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. The ten toes, again, represent, of the image represent the uniting of the ten kings under the dominance of the Antichrist. Now, when you get, if you're reading chapter 13, here's what I want you to understand something. There are two beasts mentioned in Revelation 13 as you read. The first one comes out of the sea. The second one comes out of the land. The first beast is what we call the Antichrist. And he comes out, depending on what your interpretation of it, Kind of interesting, but usually when the Bible talks about sea, it is usually talking about mankind or humans or the human race. There are many interpreters, and I understand where they come up with this at because of the part of the world that this will, that this sea they're talking about is the Mediterranean Sea, because you also see uh, the four the you know, the four horns that come up are the four. Uh, Greco-Roman empires that led to the Roman Empire. And so 
they, be they believe that it's the Mediterranean Sea, and it makes sense to believe that. But with at whichever interpretation you take, it still means that this beast rises from the people. Okay? The second beast that rises from the land, we'll talk about that more in a few minutes, is later we find what is called the false prophet. And he is part of that devilish trinity. Satan, the Antichrist, or the beast, and the false prophet. One represents the political and the economic standards of the world. The second beast that comes out of the land has the same appearance, and you'll find that in the description when you read it, as Christ. So he will be religious. He will be the religious world. And you will find out that Antichrist has a religion. That religion is atheism. We'll, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Now look at, we find out that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 12 through 15, that it reveals that the kings of the earth will finally come to the conclusion that they are not capable of governing themselves in peace with other nations around the world. Uh, thus, they will give their power and their authority to the beast. Verse 13 suggests that for the sake of world peace, they will establish a one world government that they will consider the solution to the world's problems. I want you to keep in mind something I, I wrote here, and I'm not trying to be... Uh, too political, although you can't help it. You have to be a little. But I want you to understand something. And we'll talk about this, especially a little bit more under the economy. But one thing you see happening today, especially when you see things like the United Nations, and you see that we've become global as a world. And it's, it's interesting to me, as you watch and this is one of the things, now I will be the first to admit that, and you'll probably shut me off after I say this, I am not the world's biggest Donald Trump fan. Uh, but one thing that I certainly respected about President Trump is that his ability to look at what the United States was involved in and how we were giving away our power and our authority and our money and he was cutting, cutting off the other nations and saying, no, you're going to pay your fair share and we're going to think about America. And now we see the new government is reopening those channels that's going to make us more dependent again on the rest of the world and we're actually going to voluntarily kind of step aside and take a lower place. And I know I'm probably breaking up on this, but what I'm saying is, is we are giving away our authority and our power voluntarily to other kingdoms of the world. And that is scary in, in light of what you see happening here. The United Nations are anything but united. If they're united in anything, it is to bring the United States and the rest of the world under subjection to one rule. This is, and this will go, happen more and more as the days go by. This is going to happen, and absolutely happen. This absolutely is going to happen during the tribulation period where we will more and more and finally voluntarily give ourselves over all of our power and all of our authority to the point, and listen carefully, I mean, I, I want, to the point where when you get into the tribulation period, you can't really even see a place for the United States of America. And I say this remembering, and I want you to remember, that as a country, we are a very young country country. The civilizations that we're talking about in the book of Revelations have been around for thousands of years. And so it's scary from that point. So he is going to, and so when you see things like globalization, let me, and I, and I may be getting ahead of myself, but let me just tell you something. And when it comes to things like 
uh, the economy and the mark of the beast. Think about this. Uh, in 2018, Amazon, major company, opens a store, I think it was either in Seattle or San Francisco. I'm not sure right now. I have to remember that. No cashiers, no money, no security. They simply, the customers came in. It was a grab and go situation. Customers came in, got what they wanted, walked out the door, and they tracked how much the item was and what to charge you through your cell phone, your smartphone. Because they would have sensors set up that would track your smartphone, see what you bought, right? I mean, you're getting this right. It was an experiment at that time. Uh, but And who knows what technology, which is moving so rapidly today, who knows what technology we'll have in the future. So what I'm trying to get to at this point right now is the globalization, one world government, and we will all be subjected to it under the Antichrist. It, this is just an example. And I know people, uh, but the United Nations, which was put together years ago, and today, honestly, does not have much power at all, but they're going to gain power under the Antichrist. Be careful with globalization. It's become a very small world. The pastor says we're about to become a, one, a third world country, and he agrees that <clears throat> we have left God to serve man. It's it's absolutely true, Pastor. Absolutely true. And uh you know, I I got to move on quick, and there's so and, and we'll say more as we keep looking at how this will develop. Uh, but boy, you, you just got to be careful, folks. You have to understand and read the signs. And, you know, even John says, I don't have to tell you what the truth is. You know what the truth is. He says that. Let me let me see if I can read this to if it's I have it here close. I think I underlined it because I, I wanted to make sure that you saw this in first John. Um Oh, maybe I didn't mark it. Well, let me just read this to you, okay? Because of John says in John chapter 1, I mean, 1 John, pardon me, chapter 2, he says in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father. You need to understand that, but is of the world. And then in verse 18, he says, little children, it is the last time. Now, he's not saying it's the last time I'm going to tell you. He's telling you it's the last time. And as you've heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. But ye, here's what he said. Oh, here it is. But ye have an unction. Now listen, he's not talking to ministers. He's not talking to pastors. He's talking to believers. He's talking to Israel. Ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and there is no lie in the truth. And the Word of God is revealing you to you. You know Folks, you know, you know when you look at these things, and we can have political opinions, and we can have, and it's okay, but when the truth of something comes out, the scripture says, you know, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the word of God, you know, and you've got to make a decision that it's not about gray area. You know, he says. You know through the word of God and you know through the Holy Spirit that's in you that when evil comes on you, you know the choice you need to make. But the decision is yours. And the question is, will you serve God? When the persecution comes, Jeremiah says, if you've run with the footmen and they've wearied you, what will you do when the horsemen come? If you don't start even in the small things learning to say, I'm going to serve Christ. Choose you this day, Joshua said. Pastor's been talking about that in his devotions. 
whom you will serve. It is important that in every decision that you make as a Christian from this moment on, you ask yourselves, what would Jesus do? And make that decision for Christ. Uh, what? The Antichrist will dominate the world economy. Uh, when Revelation chapter, verse, chapter 17, verse 13 states that the kings of the earth will give their power to the beast, that not only means their armies, it means their economy. He will control the money because these 10 kingdoms of the European common market, which is in place today, we talked about that, Rhonda brought that to you back a ways, and went into effect at the beginning of this century. It's not very strong right now, but it will gain strength as the, the former Roman Empire takes more and more shape as the tribulation period approaches us and the rapture of the church. It's in its infancy, but it can spread, it can cover the world. It's very easy to see right now. And that's why I brought up the thing about Amazon. But it's not just Amazon. You're being tracked and I'm being... Look, we love convenience, right? I'm, I'm telling you, as I sit here and tell you this, I don't want you to take my smartphone away. I don't want you to take my computer away. I don't want... I, I like everything I'm doing. It makes my life convenient. It does. But the price that you pay for this convenience is your privacy is out the door. I used to laugh. And, and really, even before that, let me help you something. I used to just laugh at people when they would say, I don't want to get on a computer and I don't want to get a smartphone because I want to protect my privacy. Do you remember that those paper checks you used to write out? have your account number on them, and that account number and that routing number lead to all other information about you. So this has been going on a long time. My dad told me back in the 60s, I still remember this to this day, and people laughed at him. Son, in your lifetime, I believe you will live in a cashless society. And look what's happened since then. The advent of the credit card. The credit card was around, but it wasn't like it is today. You know, the internet, the computers, uh, routing numbers, uh, <laughs> account numbers, your social security number. Yes, even your social security number was one of the beginnings of the, le of the lack of your privacy when they assigned you a number. Now, a lot of people don't look at it that way, but it's the absolute truth. When you as an individual got assigned something that recognizes who you are, you began the process of going down this path. And who knows? You cannot, you, you can't get in your car. They're all computer chips. You can't turn on your smart TV. It's all, com everybody knows what you're doing. Regardless of your best efforts, they know. I'm sorry. If you don't believe that, then just take inventory. You don't have to believe me. Just think about everything that's in your home, regardless of how old you are or what you have and what you don't have. You just think about everything that's in your home right now and everything that's been there the past 60, 70 years or more. And you'll see where this has been climaxing. Today, for instance, you can't get your social security check unless you get it directly debited into your bank account or on a debit card. These are telling signs. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to scare you. I just want you to understand what you're facing. So the Antichrist, um, this is, so he's going to control the world through globalization because he has now got all the power in the world, all authority is his, and that means he's also going to control your money. Listen, you need to understand other things that are going on, like Bitcoin. Bitcoin, which is nothing more than digital money. Uh, and you may not understand everything about that, and I don't either, but it is out there. And it will soon, there we're, very soon, you're coming to the day when cash, green dollar bills, are not going to be around anymore. Everything will be digital. Everything. 
It may be even it may not even be called money anymore. It, Bitcoin is the is the phrase of the current future, you might say. So let's look now at the Antichrist. I'm moving quickly. The Antichrist has a religion. And I want to talk briefly about this. It's atheism, folks. And believe me, it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. Because to be an atheist, you got to believe that this whole world came together in one cosmic blast and everything just fell into pieces. That would be like me taking my smartphone and smashing it, taking a hammer and smashing it, and then putting it back together exactly like it was. What do you think my odds are of that? No. Uh, the odds of evolution being true have been deciphered. It's like you winning the lottery every day for seven days without ever playing. That are the odds of evolution and the formation, the creation of the universe by the Big Bang. That Those are the odds. Then you're talking about a philosophy that says that the, the survival of the fittest, only the fit will survive. The strong will survive. That is evolutionary thinking and teaching. Deciding on who lives and who dies. You think what you're seeing right now with abortion is bad? Hang on to your hats. You haven't even begun to see what's going to happen in the future as someone else will decide whether you live or whether you die. We're right on the edge of it now. You become as what, would, what Hitler once called a useless eater. A useless eater. Tommy says, isn't it something how you can talk about a certain item and then all of a sudden it pops up as an ad on your Facebook page? Exactly. Right, right. You can like, you can like, like if you decide you want to buy a new bed and all of a sudden you, on your Facebook page or on your email, all of a sudden you get bombarded with advertisements for new beds, new, uh, new bedroom outfits. So I want you to keep, now, the, this, this, and there's some that before, you know, and I, like I said, I'm only going to spend today because we'll talk all about this again, I promise you. But I want you to understand that atheism is the bedrock of socialism and communism. You need to consider these and uh, uh, all parts of a puzzle that is fitting together. Atheism will spring up in the worship of the Antichrist because he will set himself up as a visible God with great power that everyone can see. And the Bible says that many will follow after him and be deceived by what he's doing. And this, and can you, I mean, oh. Like, for instance, what, what you're seeing in the world, what folks don't understand about socialism and communism today is that they, they, one of their main strategies is, first of all, is to start a culture war, to turn one culture, one race against the other race. But what they don't understand, as soon as that war is won, that same, that same government will now turn on the culture that just won the war until Everybody is on equal footing under one world ruler. Socialism, I mean, we just, we, we and, and I don't have enough time to even talk about it, but I want you to understand that, that you cannot build a world or a nation by one culture destroying the other culture. You can't do that. If you do that, you're going to end up with a culture that is neither human nor it, and certainly not godly. And I, I don't have time to bring all of that out, but we will as we go through the, these next five chapters. 
it's polytheism. You'll end up worshiping all kinds of gods, all religions being brought by the false prophet under one roof where you all believe the same thing. And that's not possible for the Christian. Let me, listen, let me just put this out there for you, okay? You cannot, you cannot go against the word of God and still be a Christian. You cannot compromise the word of God and still be a Christian. This is being forced down your throat today. And boy, I'll probably get in trouble for this. But listen, in, in the gay community, which is a reckoning force right now, they're trying to shove down your throat, even though they're still the minority. They are trying and our government is trying to shove down our throats that we must accept this not only as a lifestyle, but we must accept this in our religious culture. And if Christians stand pat, and what's going to happen is you will not be able, listen to me, pastor will not be able to hire a secretary just out of our church. He will have to look at all applicants, regardless of their religion, regardless of what they believe. And although he will not be able to hire a youth minister, you could end up with a gay person who says they are a Christian and love God and they apply for the job and you will not be able to stop them from applying for the job and you will have to hire them. You'll have to give them just kind of like with um, equal, employment. equal employment. If they're the best candidate and have the best credentials, you're going to have to hire them. So then you're going to have in your churches somebody who is working for you and with you who doesn't believe the Bible and doesn't believe what you believe as a Christian. You cannot stand for that. I'm sorry. You... And that doesn't love, that doesn't mean I don't love. I do love. I don't hate anybody, but I follow the Bible. And if the Bible says it's a sin, it's a sin. I don't believe in living together either. I think living together is a sin. Why do I think that? I think that because the Bible says that it is, that it is a sin. The Bible says that we are breaking the sanctity of marriage that was formed and made and by God himself. You cannot go against that as a Christian. Do I love the people that are living together? Amen. Do I want them to come to my church? Amen. I want them to hear the gospel, but I don't, I cannot recognize them as a brother or sister in Christ because they are not. And I know I'm preaching, sorry. That's what I mean when I say you will be called out as a Christian to make a clear-cut choice. You cannot back off of that. He will make a covenant with Israel. I also want, and I've talked about this a little bit, but he will also have a death a, and a burial and a resurrection just like Jesus because he will mirror everything that Jesus did that he may deceive the universe, that he may deceive mankind. But don't be afraid, folks, because his ultimate destruction is prophesied in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And it declares, And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When the Lord comes back again, when he comes back and physically touches the earth, he will once again battle Satan and his enemies, but it's a war that will not last long. He will destroy them because this is their end. And I want you to understand that you as a Christian, I got to quit, but I'm going to make say one more thing. You as a Christian need to understand this. You've read this in the scripture a million times, but get this now, understand this. You have a choice to serve God with all your heart, or you have a choice to serve Satan. You can give in to the pleasures of the flesh and getting along and living peaceably and not taking a stand. You can do that. You have that choice. But when you make that choice, you forfeit the kingdom of God and you forfeit 
your life with Jesus Christ. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And as a Christian, you need today to make that choice and make it sure. Because in the days ahead, you're going to have to make many choices or you're going to have to, there are things coming down the road that will not, you will not be able to hide behind your religion. I say that with all the compassion in my heart that I can say, and I love you. Because the same is true for me. You will not be able to hide behind your religion. You will be singled out as a child of God, or you will be singled out as a follower of the Antichrist. Folks, we love you. We got to stop there. Uh, next week, we will go into a verse-by-verse -verse study of chapter 13 and go on. Uh, don't forget that 11 o'clock today, you can attend the Rouge Free Will Baptist Church in person following the CDC guidelines. Uh, they've done a great job of sanitizing the church. I am looking forward to the day, and I, I'm probably speaking it, but, but I'm looking forward to the, to the day when I can move Sunday school back to the church. I'm really looking forward to that day. Uh, I'm looking forward to it more and more as every week passes. I cannot wait. I'm not sure when it's going to happen, but Pastor will let us know uh, when that decision comes down the pike. But I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so if you can go, go. Because the church needs to be uplifted. Our pastor needs to be uplifted. And there's nothing really that uplifts a pastor's heart more than looking out over the congregation and seeing you there. So if you can go, please go. And if you can't, we do still live stream the services on our Rude Services Facebook page and on YouTube. And don't forget 930 tonight, pastor uh, is uh, on the myharborradio.com, an internet radio station where you can hear another great gospel sermon at 9.30 p.m. tonight. Uh, the Master's Men are going to meet on Tuesday, March 9th at 6.30 p.m. at Leon's Family Restaurant on Telegraph Road in Taylor. We love you. Let's pray together, and then we'll go on and get ready to worship. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence today, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you, God, that you have given us your word and you have shown us, you have been clear in your instructions on what the future holds and what the strength and faith of the Christian should be. And God, I'm just asking you today to bless everyone who here, who heard this and took part. And may you, God, today illuminate their minds and fill us with the Holy Spirit and help us to give ourselves to prayer and study of the word of God. Lord, bless the worship service today. Bless pastor and do him with power, Lord, and that he may preach the gospel in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. May God's people be blessed and lifted up. And may some soul today that doesn't know Jesus, be it in person or over the waves of the internet or on God, that they may find Jesus Christ as the Savior of their life. Let them accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Lord, bless our prayer chain. Bless our people that are on our prayer list. And God, most of all, may you receive honor and glory from everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. We'll see you at, uh, at 11 o'clock. And don't forget, I'll be right back with you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for Praise and Worship on Facebook Live and Coffee with Charlie. God bless you, everyone. Thank you for joining me.